Bible study again. We had it this past Wednesday night and had a good group come out. So please keep that in mind. Uh, plenty of space to spread out if you don't want to kind of climb in on other people. So we will be doing that for the foreseen future unless something, something pops up on us. So Wednesday nights at 7, please, please keep that in mind. 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1, we are still there. Remember last week I said that the Apostle Peter's letters are down to earth. They're nitty gritty, rubber meets the road instruction. And last week, the entirety of the sermon rested on one verse, and that was the first verse. And there, Peter introduces himself, and then he says that this letter is written to God's elect exiles that are scattered. He goes throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia and Bithynia. Let me just stop right here for a second and say a word about those provinces. Let me give a sort of a biblical context and a contemporary world context. In Peter's day, those five provinces would have been in a place known as Asia Minor. Now for us, Asia Minor is modern day Turkey. So just keep that in mind. And when the early church began in Jerusalem among the Jews, the Roman Empire considered and they initially regarded the church as sort of a sect of Judaism. And so the empire gave the Jews an exemption from offering sacrifices to the emperor and as long as the Christians were viewed as a sect of Judaism, the Romans gave them the same exemption as well. Well, as time went on and the synagogues began expelling Christians and Christianity started to take on a distinct identity of its own. What happened was is that it lost its legal protection and it became a target for persecution. persecution. And this was the situation for the Christians in Asia Minor. And as the years rolled on, suspicion kept creeping in and it kept increasing until it turned into a raging fire time of persecution. So what Peter is doing here in his letter is he is reminding these Christians that true, it is true, they are God's elect, they are God's chosen, they are God's children, that while that is true, another reality exists as well. Simultaneously, while they are God's elect, they are also exiles that are scattered. Now again, remember, God's elect are the Christians. God's elect are are the church. And then Peter is saying a lot in four words right there. He's saying, folks, that being God's elect does not exempt from trouble. Again, they are exiles. Exiles refers to their status. Exiles refers to our status as Christians who are living in a fallen world. And we spent the entire sermon last week developing that truth, developing that reality. We are exiles, folks, because we're living in a corrupted, prostituted, polluted, distorted, and degraded version of God's original creation. And as God's elect, as God's children, as God's church, we can look back and we see what creation was in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Perfect fellowship with God. As God's church, as His children, we have Scripture, we look ahead, we look to the end of Revelation, and we see what God's creation is going to be at some point in the future. But in the meantime, we suffer. And we groan because we're living in what I call the in-between. We're living in the in-between between Genesis 3 and Revelation chapter 21. We are living after the fall when sin has infested the world, but we're living before. Before God hits the reset button. Before God sets everything straight. So this time in between is where sin reigns. It's where sin ruins. The in between is the time where Satan kills, steals, and destroys. And that's why, just as a bit of review from last week, lesson number one. 
Peter wants us to realize that we are living as exiles in a world gone crazy. We are living as exiles in a world gone crazy. And that's how he begins his letter. First and foremost, Peter says you've got to embrace that reality. And he says we may be exiles, but we are exiles. Look at verse 2 right there. We're exiles who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with His blood, Peter says there. Now folks, that's a good dose of encouragement right there, isn't it? Peter is immediately encouraging the first century Christians. Peter is immediately encouraging you and me. Folks, we may be in a, an exile in a world gone crazy, but we are also children of the king. We are members of the king's glorious spiritual kingdom. And God may not be removing from us all of the mess, but Peter wants us to know that God is always doing greater things God is doing better things in us and through us. Just look at verse 2 there while I'm talking. Notice what Peter says there. First of all, as I'm talking, I want you to notice the Trinity. How he's very intentional on mentioning each of the members of the Trinity there. Peter is telling us, yes, yes, you are exiles. Yes, you're living in a world gone crazy. But he says, Christian... Let me remind you that God has pursued you. <laughs> Jesus has saved you. The Holy Spirit is growing you. Man, that's great, isn't it? He says, don't forget that, church. You see, lesson number two, the point that he made, was making was, the entire trinity is working to see that we not only survive as exiles, but folks, God is seeing to it that the entire Trinity is working to see that we are thriving as exiles. God has not forgotten about us. God has not left us alone. God is not... Uh, unplugged in the fact that you're all wearing masks this morning. God is not aloof to the notion that the last six months for us in America has been really, really tough. Peter says the entire thrust, the entire work, the totality of the Trinity is working in your life, friends. To make sure that you don't just survive this immediate time of discomfort in our lives, but the entire Trinity is coming together to see that you thrive in this moment. Come on now, do y'all get that? Do you head like this for me? This is huge. This is a reality for us, friends. And what Peter does is he continues to build on that good news. Look at verse 3 there. He says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now notice there the two words that I have obviously highlighted that I've made to stand out. Mercy and living hope. You know, sometimes people think of God the Father as nothing but a God of judgment. A lot of people think of God the Father as always being in a bad mood. They kind of imagine him as always looking for a fight that he enjoys pouring out his wrath. And they, they imagine Jesus. Jesus is the loving one. Jesus is the merciful one. They, they imagine Jesus as having to step in front of God and say, Whoa, 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 big boy. Whoa, big guy, let's calm down here. Let's, let's show a little mercy here. People got a picture of Jesus, you know, nudging up with his shoulder against God, kind of backing God back in his judgment. But what Peter reminds us of here is that it was the love of God. 
It was the mercy of God the Father that drew up salvation's plan. Church, the Father wrote the plan and the Son carried out the plan. Jesus was God's expression of mercy. Jesus was God purchasing salvation for us through His death on a cross. Jesus lived the life that we were supposed to live. Jesus died the death that we should have died. And He didn't just die for us. He died instead of us. And Peter says, and and all of that adds up to our salvation. And our salvation provides us with a living hope. What's a living hope? Well, living hope is a hope that is stronger than death. A living hope is a hope that extends beyond death. And what Peter wants us to see this morning is lesson three. Living hope, church, is rooted in the resurrection. Living hope is rooted in the resurrection. You see, the resurrection crushed everything that could destroy us, that could defeat us spiritually. So we have to ask ourselves this morning. Let's think about it. In what do we ground? In what do we base our hope for the future? Uh, Friend, answer for yourself. What do you believe will give you the future that you are longing for? Uh, Maybe you. Maybe everything for you. It's your hope for the future. It's grounded in the assumption that this this pandemic won't last forever. That's what's getting you through. That's what's getting you up in the morning. That's what's helping you to put one foot in front of the other. Maybe, Maybe your hope, maybe your future will be defined or destroyed by the right person being elected president in less than 100 days. But what is it? What is it in which we ground our hope for the future? Viktor Frankl. He was a Jewish Austrian doctor who was imprisoned at Auschwitz during World War II and he managed to survive that horrendous event. And and Viktor Frankl, he wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. And in the book he described how various prisoners dealt with despair in Auschwitz. And he tells in the book that some of them responded by becoming brutal and cruel. They kind of lived the life inside of Auschwitz and it was the survival of the fittest. It's either me or them talking about the other Jews. He, he says some just gave up. And, and Frankel wrote, here's what he said. He says usually... This happened quite suddenly. The symptoms of which were familiar to us who had been at Auschwitz for a while. We all feared for this moment in our friends. Usually, he said, it began one morning when the prisoners simply refused to get dressed or wash or go out to the parade grounds for inspection. No entreaties, no blows, no threats had any effect. They just lay there. They had given up. Nothing bothered them anymore because, he says... They had no hope. Frankel goes on in his book and he explains that while many <clears throat> explain that many held on to the hope that if they just stayed alive, if they could just survive one more day, it was always just one more day, they believed in their hope and they wrapped everything around the belief that if they just stayed alive, their health, their family, their professional achievements, their fortunes, their positions in society, their employment would all be restored to them. That when the doors to Auschwitz was open, they would return to Austria or Poland or wherever they would come from. And they believed, and their hope was based on the fact that literally they would step right back in and pick up in the exact same place where they left off when the Germans grabbed them and took them to Auschwitz. And Viktor Frankl says that was the foundation for their hope. And he says there in his his book, he says, but after the liberation, he says these Jews who didn't make it, they went home and he says they found that those things that they had dreamed about, 
their homes, their jobs, their families, their communities, their, their fortunes, their societal status. He says what they discovered and what hit them up the side of the head was all of those things were gone. And they weren't coming back. And he says those people fell into this deep depression. And he said, and and what added insult to injury, the very people who had survived Auschwitz by clinging to that hope that they would be restored to the point at which they were when the Germans took them to Auschwitz in the first place. He says, they survived Auschwitz with that hope, but when they realized that that hope was false, that hope was gone, there was no hope of getting that back, he says they couldn't survive that. And many of them committed suicide. What the Germans couldn't take from them, a false hope did. He says the ones who truly overcame Auschwitz were the ones, pardon me, who had a firm, fixed reference point beyond this world. Something they held on to that was beyond the grasp of death and destruction. Frankel said life in a concentration camp tears open a soul and it exposes its death, depths and its foundations. And folks, that's what Peter is saying here. That's the point that Peter is making for us as exiles living in a world gone crazy. Sure, we're not trying to survive a concentration camp, but we're trying to survive in a world gone crazy. And we must have, Peter says, a fixed reference point beyond this world. Let's keep going. Lesson number four. Death, disease, disaster, and the disruptions of life expose the strength of our hope. I almost use the word there, veracity. The strength of our hope. Jesus wanted to know, didn't He? Didn't He, church? Jesus wanted to know if our house was built on solid rock or what? Y'all can say, answer me, on what? Sinking sand, didn't he? And unfortunately, what Frankel says is that most of the prisoners at Auschwitz had placed their hope on sinking sand. And the truth is, and it's unfortunate, most Christians of today are placing their hope on sinking sand. Because we have to ask ourselves, church, what if the pain never goes away? What then? What if the relationship never gets better? What if you don't get the job? What if your guy doesn't become president? What if this economy never improves? What if indeed it's not just a buzzword, but we are in a new normal and this pandemic has changed everything as we know it forever? Do you have a shelter that the storms of life can't shake? Do you have a refuge that the distractions of life can't take? Do you have a hope? Do I have a hope? Do we have a hope that death can't touch? That's what Peter's asking us. You see, Peter is saying and teaching us lesson five. He's saying if if we need anything in our life to change in order to have peace or to be happy, we haven't found the living hope that he's talking about. Folks, living hope is a joy. Living hope is a peace. It is a faith that we have despite the situations that we find ourselves in. 
And Peter digs deeper into this. He says that living hope consists of, starting with verse 4 right here, you can follow along with me. It is an inheritance, he says, that can never perish, spoil, or fade. He says this inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. He says, in all of this, you greatly rejoice. Though now, for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. He says, these have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. He says, though you have not seen Him, you love Him. And even though you do not see Him now, you believe in Him. And you are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Why? Look at verse 9 there. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, The salvation of your souls. Man, Peter puts that on on a high shelf, doesn't he? Peter holds that in, in very high regard. Well, notice what Peter teaches us about this living hope. Lesson number six, church. Living hope longs to know Jesus Christ. Living hope longs to know Jesus Christ. Notice verse eight right there. Peter says that is the goal of our salvation. The goal of the hope that sustains us in a world gone crazy, friends, is knowing and loving and enjoying God. God Himself is the ultimate end of our salvation. God Himself is the foundation and the goal of our hope. So we have to ask ourselves, coming to this point in Peter's letter, do we love God for God Himself or do we love God for what God can do for us? Sometimes, sometimes our love for God, let's be candid, is a means to an end. I'm going to stay close to God because God can do a whole lot for me. You know, successful kids, streets of gold, all those good stuff. And if He doesn't do anything for me, then I'm going to move on. Well, folks, that's basing the worth of God on what we can get out of Him. You know, that's usury. We're just using God to get out of God what we want. But hopefully, hopefully we love God simply because God is worthy and incredible and beautiful. Do we have a hunger and thirst not for what God will do for us? Or do we have a hunger and thirst for God Himself? Do we long to know Him better just because of who He is? Are we drawn to Him because He's this mysterious, loving, gracious, almighty? Peter explains to us lesson number seven, living hope. Living hope longs to be like Jesus Christ. So it it doesn't just long to know God in Jesus. Living hope longs to be like Jesus. Jesus Christ. Again, look there at verse 9. Peter talks about, look at it, the end result of our faith. What is it? The salvation of our souls. Folks, our salvation is an ongoing process. We are being saved every day. You are being saved every day. The work of our salvation is not completed until we are in eternity with Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit Peter's teaching us here, is constantly refining us and making us holy. He is equipping us for life in the kingdom of God in a world that has gone crazy. And He is preparing us for life in the kingdom of God that has a future reality, a future eternity. Uh, I was reading these these verses this week and I realized, you know, Paul is not the only theologian of the Bible. Peter can step out on that water as well. And, And notice here really quickly that Peter reminds us of three critical parts of our salvation. Now this will be a good communion meditation sometime. One, 
Folks, we have been freed from the penalty of sin. We have been freed from the penalty of sin. Look at verse 3 there. This is called justification. Verse 3 says, He has given us a new birth. Folks, justification happens when we touch the death of Jesus Christ in baptism. And when we touch the death of Jesus Christ in baptism, God declares us not guilty. Jesus takes our guilt, we take His righteousness. Folks, this is being released from the spiritual curse of Genesis chapter 3. So we have been freed, Peter says, from the penalty of our sin. Ready for number 2? Let's go to 2. We have been freed from the power of sin. Folks, this is called sanctification. This is becoming like Christ. This is spiritual growth and holiness. This is God's spiritual protection while we're living in the in-between. Notice what Peter says there in verse 4. Through faith we are shielded by God's power. Folks, this is in the present. This is the right now. This is the dual reality in our Christian walk. This is the spiritual armor of Ephesians. This is the spiritual fruit of Galatians. This is the nothing can separate us of Romans. This is the rejoicing in the Lord always of Philippians. This is God moving us and shielding us spiritually while we are living in the in-between. And notice by the way I say spiritually. Because God never guaranteed us God never promised us that we would be exempt from the trouble, the despondency, the mishaps, the mess-ups, the nitty-grittiness of a fallen world. God never promised us that we would be exempt from those things physically. But God has promised us time and time again that He would shield us spiritually. I'll just say it, that's good stuff. <laughs> Three, three. We have been freed from the presence of sin. This is called glorification. I actually wrote that wrong now that I look at it. It should be we will, we will be free. Fix that on your note taker for me, will you please? Go up there and, and draw a line through have been and put will above it. We will be freed from the presence of sin. This is called glorification. This is in the future. This is in eternity. This is the new heavens and the new earth. Folks, this is finally getting to Revelation 21. Yeah. <laughs> no more death, no more sin, no more pain, no more tears. God will wipe all of those away. Peter says there in verse 5, Through faith we are shielded by God's power uh, until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed. When say it? When is it going to be revealed? In the last time. And it will be at that point, little prater, we'll be finally and fully like Jesus Christ. It's going to be at that point that we'll have perfect and pure hearts. Oh, friends, we will not be living in a world gone crazy. We won't be wearing masks, but we will be wearing white robes. <laughs> Oh, even so, come Lord Jesus, right? <laughs> come on, Lord. We will be living in a new heaven and a new earth that will be saturated with the glory of the Father. Mm. That's our hope. It's what we cling to. It's what we read about. It's what we sing about. Part of what we celebrate here at this table. And ladies and gentlemen, I would just ask you this morning, is that part of your hope? Is it? You know, a lot of Christians talk about what they've been saved from. I don't hear a lot of Christians talk about what they've been saved for. When we examine our Christian life this year, is it obvious that we're more like Christ than we were last year? When we wake up tomorrow morning, Monday morning, our feet hit the floor, what plans do we have to become more like Jesus Christ? Well, this dovetails into the last dimension of our living hope that Peter teaches us here in chapter 1, lesson number 8. Oh, folks, living hope looks forward to being with Jesus Christ. Living hope looks forward 
to being with Jesus Christ. In verse 4 again, Peter reminds us that we have an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. So what Peter does there, he's giving us the light at the end of the tunnel. He describes the eternity that awaits God's children. And what he does is he says the same thing three different ways. He says, our inheritance can never perish. That means, folks, it will never be destroyed. He says our inheritance can never spoil. That means nothing will ever corrupt it. Our inheritance can never fade. It will not get boring. Uh, I wrote here on my notes this week, because our inheritance will never fade, that means it will never lose its oomph. That's a good theology word for you right there. Write that on your note taker. I'm not sure how you spell that. I put U-M-P-H. Explanation point. So you can use it. But that's what it means, folks. We're not going to be bored in heaven. Uh, the shine's not going to wear off. It's not going to get old. Praise Jesus. It's not going to wear out. And guess what? We're not going to wear out. It's not going to lose. It's what? It's, <clears throat> folks, it will always be glorious. And Peter says that is the heart of our living hope. To know Jesus. To be like Jesus. To be with Jesus. And folks, knowing Jesus, Peter says, being like Jesus, being with Jesus, changes the way we experience the crazy world around us. You see, here's what happens. Lesson nine. The difficulties, the disruptions of life forces us to release our grip on this world and cling to Jesus Christ. Look at verses 6 and 7 there. He says, In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. You see what Peter is telling us there as believers is that the difficulties and the disruptions of life, folks, they show us that this crazy world is sinking sand. They show us that Jesus is the only solid rock. Uh, the difficulties and the disruptions of life, the ongoing upheaval in our nation's communities that defy political solutions, that defy secular solutions. Folks, they are screaming that there is a fierce spiritual battle being waged in the heavenlies and that there's only one solution and there's only one side to be on and there's only one conquering king. And we can have sinking sand hope that we as human beings, that some politician, that one more law can fix and give a solution to all of the chaos that's going on around us. Peter is telling us that that's just showing us, you know what, it's not working. And if we put our hope in an ultimate human solution, we're going to be let down. It's pointing us to a bigger solution, a better solution, a solution outside of this world. That pain, my friends, in your body reminds you how fragile life really is. And it teaches you to value the things that really matter. But let's be candid, COVID-19, it has shattered our self-centeredness, our self-sufficiency, and it, is for, it has forced us to reorient our priorities. Church Peter is just teaching us as exiles, God will use the difficulties and the disruptions of life to purify us and make us more like Jesus. He'll use them to purify us and prepare us for His kingdom work here on earth. He'll use them to purify us and create a longing within us for the next world. So here's the bottom line. If you are going to have a living hope in this world, uh, in this world that has gone crazy, 
You absolutely have to get your focus off of this world and put it on the kingdom of God. Period. So, so the big question for us today... Um, you know, folks, it's, I think y'all know this. I know this, but it's a good reminder for us. We, we realize, don't we, that quote-unquote invitation time is, is not just for the unsaved, right? Uh, invitation decision time is it's for all of us. I think while we're singing, it's a time for us to reflect on the truth of God's Word that we just heard and we ask... Okay, what do I need to do differently based on the truth I've just heard? What do I need to stop doing? What do I need to start doing based on the truth that I've just... It's a time of... Um, I really think we're to call it the self-examination hymn. <laughs> I know that doesn't flow, but it, it gives the point, doesn't it? <clears throat> we self-examine ourselves. And so we have to ask folks, what is your reference point? We all have our gaze fixed on something. Those poor folks, many of those poor folks in Auschwitz had fixed their gaze on temporal things, perishable things, things that uh, moth and the rust corrupts, things that fade away. They had their focus fixed on the kingdom of this earth. We have to decide for ourselves, is our gaze, is our hope, is our reference point on things of the kingdom of earth or the things of the kingdom of God? That's what we have to answer. Here in just a second, we're going to sing victory in Jesus and that's where victory does lie, isn't it? In Jesus Christ, this world's not going to bring us victory. No. Relationship's not going to bring you victory. Uh, political solution's not going to bring you ultimate victory. It is in Jesus Christ. Maybe, friend, you don't know Jesus personally. Man, we offer you that opportunity. We'd love to baptize you and embrace you as a new brother or sister. Maybe... Maybe you need to repent and just rededicate. Maybe you need prayer. Folks, I don't know. The Holy Spirit knows. And I'd ask the Holy Spirit that He'd convict you and He'd move you as we're singing. Gerald's going to come up. He's going to lead our time. I'm going to play. Would y'all stand, please? We invite you, whatever you need, friends, to come to run to Jesus. <clears throat>